Shout your freedom everywhere as eternal peace declare. Victory, victory. While we're standing, let's take our Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to, I believe, continue on with the same thought from Sunday and discernment. I can have no clue what the title is, so I just said part two. So it's easier that way, discernment part two. Then I want to review some things that we talked about on Sunday because I just didn't want to leave this subject yet. There were still some more nuggets in here that the Lord was dealing with me on, and I'd like to share those with you. Amen. So before we move on, I would like to just go through it again and see what the Lord has for us. So let's look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll begin reading at verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Amen. The Lord is asking us to examine ourselves. The Lord is asking us to judge ourselves, and if we judge ourselves, we should not be, we should not be judged. Uh, but the part that I love the most, it says, but when we are judged... If we fail in our self-examination, if we fail to judge ourselves, then he will judge us. But it says when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. That's getting a spanking. That we should not be condemned with the world. Praise God. God will not lose his children. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. Father, we know that you've made it possible for us to gather again by your grace we know that this is your mercy extended, Lord, and we just pray, God, that you would now speak to us, Lord, through these lips of clay. May you break the bread of life. May you speak, Lord, your eternal word. May you feed your sheep now, Lord, as we wait patiently on you. God, may we go from here full, Lord, on the word and being filled, Lord, with your spirit, and may we go forth, Lord, as lights in this dark world. May you have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can each be seated. Amen. So we can see by this that um, we're asked to judge ourselves, to examine ourselves, and to judge ourselves that we should not be judged. If we're going to judge ourselves, we need to have some degree of discernment. And like we said Sunday, discernment comes by the word. And I'd like to go through some of these scriptures that we went through Sunday. So let's turn over to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read two places over here. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever." We looked at this scripture and we looked at it in relation to the temptation that Eve went through and how she was tempted and, and she was, uh, when she was tempted, she began to look at the tree, amen, but what, what created the temptation or what actually moved her to begin to consider this tree, amen, was the, the, the serpent had asked her, amen, as the Lord said, you can eat of all the trees, and she answered, yea, we may eat of all, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we shall not eat of it, neither touch it, lest we die. And then the serpent introduced a new thought to her. He said, you know, you're not surely die, but God doth know. Amen. You know, if he had just contradicted the word, if he had just said, you'll not surely die and walk on, I wonder if Eve would have been tempted to take of the tree. But he did more than just say, you'll not surely die, but God doth know that the day you eat of her, your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And now all of a sudden he awakened a desire, a lust inside of Eve, amen, to, to know more, amen, to be as a God, to be something more. And we find so many times that when we are tempted, amen, so many times we're tempted to have more, amen, or... or um, uh, seemingly to have more because she was already a God on the earth, amen? 
She was already a joint heir. She was already uh, co-reigning with her mate, with Adam, and they were reigning as gods upon the earth and, and, and <clears throat> been given dominion over everything on the earth. And, but now he, he began to entice her, amen, with a need to know more or, or that there was a lack, amen. And she was sitting in perfection, and the devil got her to believe that she was lacking, she was sitting in the seat of perfection, God's great creation of love and joy and peace and harmony in perfect fellowship with God. And the devil convinced her that she was missing out or lacking something. Amen. And she began to fixate on the lack instead of on the abundant mercy and grace of God. So the blessings of God were, she was in the midst of it. She already had this position that the devil was trying to get her to take. And so then under that kind of temptation, she begins to look at the tree. And when she begins to look at the tree, now she sees that it's good for food. Amen. And lust of the flesh and uh, a, a, a tree to be desired, lust of the eyes and uh, uh, whatever. I can't remember it all, but a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. And we see that now she's tempted, amen, by these lusts the lust of the world, and she fails. And we know that she's deceived. She thinks she's doing right when she's actually doing wrong. She was beguiled by the serpent. We understand that. But he had to turn on her own desire, her own lust first by showing her that she was missing out on something when in fact she was missing out on nothing. And I'd like to say the same is true for us today. There is absolutely nothing we're missing out on. As a child of God, if you believe that you're one of the predestined and elect chosen of God, the footsteps of the righteous are ordered to the Lord, and God has you in the place he wants you to serve his purpose for this time, for this season, and he's given us what he needs for this time and this season, then there's nothing we're lacking, amen? We're in his position, in his time, in his place, amen? But if he can begin to make us feel like we need something more, amen, then he can begin to get us enticed into to looking at something for some sort of gain when we don't need gain. We just need to receive from our husband what he's given to us. So this is where we can begin to judge ourselves and examine ourselves. And, and so many times, you know, when we say we, we should judge ourselves, um, I feel like for me personally, as time goes on and, and God continues to shape and mold us by the word and molds me by the word, amen, he, his scalpel keeps going deeper into my heart. And it's no longer he's cutting away the fleshly things on the outside, but God is going down really deep on the inside. And I feel like for me, the message is getting deeper. But when I say the message is getting deeper, it's not getting deeper just in mysteries. It's not getting deeper just in revelation. The, my the mystery of the message is getting deeper inside of me to root out all of self. And, it, and it's, it's cutting deeper and deeper all the time. Praise God. Let's go to James chapter one. James chapter one, and we'll read verse 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So, you know, when we begin to fall and we find ourselves in sin, we realize that we were uh, uh, enticed and led away of our own lust and enticed. This is what happened to Eve. I mean, this is what Satan tried to do to Jesus, and he comes to Jesus in the great wilderness, his hour of temptation, and he, and he begins to tell him, you are hungry, you need food. And now he's trying, the devil is trying to get Jesus on his own accord and by his own will, amen, to, to, to use his gift to satisfy his hunger. 
He's tempting him into using his gift for himself and using his gift his, according to his own will and using his gift for himself. And he says, now you're hungry. Make these stones and the bread. And the Bible said he had fasted 40 days and afterward was a hungered. He was now hungry so that that was true that he was hungry. But the devil was trying to take the fact that he was hungry and use it for lustful purposes, for his own lust, for his own gain, that he would now exercise his gift. And he says, if you're the son of God, amen why are you suffering if you're the son of God why are you hungry if you're the son of God amen turn these stones into bread and then Jesus was very quick to tell him I don't need bread I need the word man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God amen he wasn't falling amen because if the brother if Jesus needed bread God had a way to provide him bread he didn't need to go find or make his own bread Manna, can, it, could, it could come by ravens, amen. It could come by manna as dew upon the earth. It could come in many different ways. Fowl of the air, amen, can fly overhead and you can just pick them up. There was all kinds of ways that his father could feed him. He didn't need to find his own way. And he didn't need to be enticed into moving his own way. And what Jesus is demonstrating to us, amen, is he's demonstrating a, 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 a human being, amen, a son of God that has come into absolute perfect surrender to the will of the Father. Absolute perfect surrender to the will of the Father. And that is an example for you and I. Then the devil comes and he, and he tries to make him prove his sonship. And he says, now, you know, cast thyself down from this temple <clears throat> because the scripture says that his angels, he'll give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone. And he starts to use the scripture and he, and he, see the devil is using the scripture, but he's using it out of context and he's using it out of place. Amen. And, and Jesus is not falling for it because now the devil is trying to get Jesus to prove his sonship when the word never required for him to prove his sonship to the devil. The father wasn't asking him to prove his sonship to the devil. The father had just spoken as when the pillar of fire came down like a dove and rested upon him. He just spoke out and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. So there was no need. He was already identified by the father. He did not need to prove his identity. And we need to make sure we don't get sucked into the same trap. Amen. God has already identified us through the opening of the word. Amen. He has already given us a capacity to receive the word. There's already a crystal placed on the inside that's tuned to the same frequency as the word. And the opening of the word hit the crystal and something inside came alive and said, that's it. And when the message come forth, it was the mirror of God's word. And we looked in the mirror. We said, mama, that's me. Amen. That's me, what that man preaching is me, that eagle scream is me, that's me. I don't need another identification. The word has identified me as bride. I don't need to get into the devil's trap of, well, you know, the scripture says this and the scripture says that. The scripture says all of that. I won't deny it. Amen, and all of it is, is applicable and all of it's the word, but I will not be drawn into trying to prove my sonship according to the devil's uh, definition of what makes me a son or according to the definition, the, 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 the obstacle course that the devil has laid out. And he says, if you walk this tight wire, you're a son of God. Now if you go across the beam, you're a son of God. If you can cross this stream, now you're a son of God. I'm not on that obstacle course, amen. I'm walking on the king's highway according to a personal revelation from Jesus Christ himself. The word has identified us. We don't need another identity. We don't need to prove our identity. God, God will prove his word. So we don't want to get sucked into those things. Let's look at John chapter 5. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 30. Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. This is interesting. Jesus says, my judgment is just. 
But how did he know his judgment was just? Because he seeked the will, not his own will, but the will of the Father which sent him. When Jesus surrendered his will to the will of the Father, and the only thing he wanted was God's will, he, that was his vindication that his judgment was just. Because there was no self-desire mixed in. There was no selfishness. There was no self mixed in. He said, my judgment is true because I don't seek my will, but I seek the will of the Father that sent me. That made his judgment just. And, and now we're told to judge ourselves, amen, but when we go to judge ourselves, when we examine ourselves according to 1 Corinthians 11, and he says, judge yourself so you're not, you'll not be judged, with what judgment do we need to judge ourselves? I say, after this example, we need to judge ourselves, amen? We need to judge ourselves according to the will of the Father, which is his word, and not to selfish desires. We've got to learn to die to self and surrender self, amen, and not get self in the picture, but just let the message of the hour, the revealed word, let it do the judging because that is the will of the Father. Praise God. So we need discernment to judge according to the word. Now let's turn to Matthew, Matthew 16. <clears throat> I want to pick up here at the last part of, the, of this here in Matthew 16. We talked about this last time. This is where Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter gave the correct answer, amen? But immediately after all of that discourse, it says, <clears throat> from that time forth began Jesus to show, this is verse 21, sorry. Chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again <clears throat> the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto, unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. We read that portion last time, and we begin to understand by this that Peter, <clears throat> Peter, after having received this revelation, and Peter knowing that he was the son of God, amen, he, he still, Peter was still getting himself in the way. Peter took him and began to rebuke him and say, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And we realize, and this is what I explained last time, that Peter really was of the mind that, that Jesus was coming to set up the earthly kingdom right then, amen? That he's gonna set up the kingdom of David, that they were gonna drive out the Romans, that, the great, that this, 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 uh, his master was coming into power, and when his master came into power, he would come too. And he had a different doctrinal understanding than Jesus had. Is that true? Jesus had a true understanding of the word and the will of God, and Jesus began to explain how that he must suffer. He must go into Jerusalem and be uh, evilly treated, and men must suffer, be killed on the third day and rise. But, but Peter had a different doctrinal understanding, and Peter began to mix himself in and rebuke the Lord. Amen. And it looked like he loved the Lord, but the truth is Peter loved himself. Peter, Peter did not want the Lord to be evilly treated. He did not want him to be crucified. He did not want him to die because it didn't match his understanding of the scripture. And it didn't bring the blessing and the promise and, the, and it didn't bring the, the, the outcome that Peter was looking for. And because Peter already had a preconceived idea, when the word made flesh was standing there giving them the will and word of God, he began to resist the word, amen, because he had his own idea and understanding of the word mixed in. Because Peter's understanding of the word actually benefited Peter. See, this is what's so dangerous about human beings, amen? And it makes me wish that I wasn't one sometimes. 
Because the selfishness that's come, I mean, that's been inbred through hybridization, amen, this selfish and self-desire and I and me mentality is something that we constantly fight in this flesh, and that's what Peter had. And Peter's doctrinal idea, the reason, he, he says, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. He said flesh and blood is not, uh, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, he says, whatever he says, you know what he says. Amen. Flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father which in heaven has revealed it to thee. So now he, he gets the revelation. He knows who this is. And just, a, just after that, he said, and, and just after that, he begins to explain to them that he's going to suffer. And Peter will end up resisting the one he just, by divine revelation, called the Christ, the son of the living God, because uh, Peter had to hold this doctrine because this doctrine served Peter. And Peter didn't want to suffer, amen? And that's the problem. Nobody wants to suffer, amen? Nobody wants to suffer loss. Nobody wants to give up anything. Amen, we all want to take care of me. And the quicker we identify that, the easier life's going to be. We just come to terms with the fact that I'm always trying to protect me and I'm always trying to surrender that to God and take God at his word and die to myself. That's the battle. <clears throat> So this is the discord. I'm going to read verse 23 again. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. If he actually understood the plan of God and had the revelation of the plan of God before the foundation of the world, Peter would have been elated with this statement. Because it meant his redemption, it meant his salvation. It was his purging from sin. It was purchasing him back to God. But he had no revelation of the will of God. He was blinded now by his own desire for self-gain, amen, and, and power and all of these other things that when the true revelation of the word came because it didn't match his self-serving doctrine, he was willing to resist it in the face of the word. <clears throat> I tell you, we need discernment. I'll savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What good instructions immediately after this discourse. This was, this was a pinpointed statement. This wasn't just a statement he made. He was actually addressing the problem. Jesus come and he identified the problem and he was addressing the problem if any man shall come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit, profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So Jesus now gives very good instructions right after all this dialogue that he had, and he's telling them, now listen, he looks at his disciples after he, he rebukes Satan that's working through Peter, he comes and he says, now take up your cross. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me. He's actually addressing the problem and giving the solution to the problem. <clears throat> Brother Ram says in the message, be not afraid from 1961, he said, Zach, he has seen that him being a small in stature, as he testified, he could not get to see the master. So he runs down to another corner, knowing which way he was going through the city, and he climbed up in the sycamore tree. So now I'll just sit up here on these where two limbs meet. That's a good place to sit where two ways meet. That's your idea and God's word. <clears throat> See where your ideas and his meet. That's a good place to rest just for a few minutes. Decide on which way you're going to go from there. Praise God. Let's go back to Matthew 4. Go back to the temptation in the wilderness. Now when you see, <clears throat> as Jesus is tempted in the wilderness and then through the statements of Peter and, and so on, there's always an attempt for the devil to get Jesus to save himself or to get him to act on his own accord or for his own purpose according to his own will. <clears throat> and Jesus never takes the bait. He never falls for it. 
When you realize then the real temptation, from what I've gathered from looking at this, the real temptation for us is not to go down to the bar room and start drinking. I mean, are you tempted to do that? The real temptation when it comes down to it, I mean, we may wind up there someday, but we didn't start there. The real temptation was for us to act according to our own will, for our own purpose, for our own good, and for our own gain. That's where the temptation is. And it can start off really subtle and really simple, amen, and seemingly religious and seemingly okay, amen, but as soon as the devil gets us to trip up to begin to take care of self, amen, we're going to lose focus of God's great plan in this day, and we're going to find ourselves derailed and under correction, amen, but if we, if we don't judge ourselves, if we're judged, he will chasten us, that we won't be condemned with the world. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. <clears throat> Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels come and ministered unto him. Now, this was going to be Jesus' position. In the millennium, all the kingdoms will be his. But the devil is trying to get him to shortcut God's plan. Trying to get him, he was born the son of David, amen. That's what the angels proclaim, amen, to the shepherds that in this day in the city of David is born a Christ the king, amen. He was born in the city of David, the son of David, to sit upon the throne of David. And here the devil gives him an opportunity, but he brings him an opportunity that bypasses God's plan and he's going to give him the end goal of having the, the reign over all of the earth with no suffering, with no sacrifice. And we've got to be careful, friends, that, that we don't try to get to the program, to the blessings of God, amen, without surrender, without sacrifice, with, without death to self, amen, because we're never, we, we, we're, it's a temptation, amen, to jump ahead of God's program, but you can never get ahead of God's program because God has so fixed his program that he, he, he is working always in righteousness, and God does know, amen, that, that power without character is satanic. And there's no jumping ahead. There's no getting. There is no getting ahead in the program of God or shortcutting or getting to the blessings of God. Amen. Unless we first learn some things that we need to to get to the place of power and authority. God has a road mapped out that makes sure that everything's in equity, amen, and that as God lifts the bride up, amen, that she can go up in humility and she can go up, amen, in humility and reverence and surrender and self-sacrifice, but she doesn't go up in pride and arrogancy. <clears throat> Because power without character is satanic, amen? So we cannot skip ahead because there's things that we must go through to learn, to understand, to gain character so that we can handle the things that come next. And so there's, there's an attempt, amen, to, to the devil will bring temptation to try to reach forward and reach ahead and get a hold of things before their time. But all things come in time. God has a plan. Brother Bram said in things that are to be, Jesus was taken by Satan up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world that was, would be, what more, and Satan claimed them his, and Jesus never argued with him because he is the God of this world, see. And he said, I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. See, he was trying to give them over to Jesus without sacrifice. See, it was a bargain that he was going to make him. And Jesus didn't take the bargain. Now, I want to skip over to 1 Kings. It sounds maybe like this is out of context, but it, I think it's in context. 1 Kings chapter 3. And you'll see very quickly when we begin to read where we're at. 1 Kings chapter 3, and let's read verse 24. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 24. And the king said, bring me a sword. This is Solomon sitting on his throne of judgment. You know, in Solomon, he prayed a prayer. 
He prayed a prayer for wisdom and discernment to discern from good and bad, amen, so that he can rule the people. So Solomon has a gift of discernment and he's sitting on his throne with his gift of discernment and we know the story, there, there came two women, two harlots, amen, and they each had a child, amen, and in the night, amen, one overlaid her child and smothered it to death and killed it, amen, so she took the other woman's child, and now the dispute is over the living baby. Now, there's two women claiming this baby is theirs, and Solomon is here. He's got to pass judgment. He's got to use his gift of discernment to pass judgment, and this is a serious case. So then said the king in verse 23, I'll go back up to verse 23. Then saith the king, the one saith, this is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, nay, thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, oh, my lord, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. But the other said, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. When we look at this whole scenario, it's, it's, it's interesting but the, the point that I'm trying to drive at is with discernment, he understood that the person with the truth, with the reality, amen, who knows the truth is always willing to sacrifice for the truth. Always willing to give. And whoever that child belonged to naturally, amen, that, that whoever had the truth and whoever was attached to that child and belonged to that child and that child to that mother, amen, they were willing to sacrifice for truth, amen? Because the truth was, that's my child, that's come from me, I'm the mother, that's the truth, amen? And whoever had the truth was willing to give up for the truth, to sacrifice, to die for the truth. But those who, that, that were not in truth, amen, amen, they didn't care. They were only about self-gain, amen. The woman, did, the woman wanted a living child. She overlaid her child and it died. So in self-gain and self-love, she takes from the other woman the child. And now she's standing here selfish with self and self-love before the king. And the king is able to discern this by saying, let's just take away, amen, let's just divide this child and split it in two. But the one who was in truth yearned for the truth and was willing to sacrifice so that the baby could, could live and say, give it to that woman. The woman who was here for herself was said, neither it be mine or thine. Divide it. And this holds true to the word, friends. Because if that word and you are united, amen, if there's a link between you and the word, amen, you will sacrifice for the word. You will give up for the word because you're part of that truth. It is truth that I come from that word. I'm part of that word. Me and that word are united, amen. But the one who is just there to selfishly gain from the word, amen, will say, well, be this or be that. I don't mind. It doesn't matter to me. But the one who's in truth and attached to the word is willing to sacrifice. And it's true for the bride of Jesus Christ. She is willing to give up her life for that baby, for this word, amen, for the son of man. She's willing to give up all because she's attached to it, friends. Her heart yearneth for it, amen. It, 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 they're united in a bond. That was a natural bond. This is a supernatural spiritual bond between you and the word. But there's people who just take it or leave it. I mean, I'm not talking outside the message. I know when people come to message church and live the way they want to live, not according to the message of the hour, not according to the word, not according to the, to the conduct that is given to us through a prophetic ministry in this day. They just do and they pick and choose and, and they make it Brother Brandon's opinion or, or I, I think or I feel and in this circumstance and they begin to manipulate the word for self. Manipulating the word for self, for self-benefit, for self-gain, for self-satisfaction, for popularity, amen, for prestige, for power, for gain, for, for selfish desire, for whatever reason. 
Oh, but there's a bride on this earth who's connected to that word and says, I, hey, 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 just, just leave it alone, amen. Just preserve it the way it is. Just let that word live, amen. But others don't mind to divide it and hack it to pieces and take a portion and leave a portion. And have some and not all, amen. But, but the bride is saying, I want it all. Leave it intact. Leave it living. Even if I can't have it, don't mess with the word, amen, because the word is pure and the word is beautiful. And she, the bride, is willing to sacrifice for the word. She's willing to surrender for the word. She's willing to submit to the word. So Solomon here, in all of his wisdom and his power of discernment, he unlocked a key to discernment. That those in truth, that the real mama would sacrifice for what was truly hers. And the real bride will sacrifice for her mate, for her husband, the revealed word of the hour. She will surrender, she will come last, she will become abased. She will give in, she will give up for the sake of the word. She will be despised, she will be rejected, she'll be misunderstood for what? For the sake of the word. Amen. Not a portion, but for all of it. There's a key to discernment. And say, how much do I love this word? We're not, we're not preaching this, and I'm not preaching it, for us to be better at discerning other people. We've got PhDs in that. And most of the time we're wrong. But I'm preaching this so that we can be better equipped to discern us. And I want my discernment to be just. Because I don't want my own will. I just want the will of the Father. And i got to keep checking my motives and checking my objectives and checking my reasons for things so that it's not my will because if it becomes my will, hey, then, then my judgment will be unjust. But if I want my judgment to be just, then I cannot judge according to my own will. I must judge according to the will of the Father. Amen. Praise God. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read verse 3. 3 to 11. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Know this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of our sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Oh, praise God. Do you want to be free from sin? Then die. Die to self. If you want to be free from sin, die out to self. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to be dead. Dead to self, dead to sin, dead to hybridization, dead to all of those things, but alive in Christ. In the message, hear ye him, Brother Benham says, now, if that gun would have started from the beginning and the weather be dies, Brother Benham's talking about a gun. He, he always wanted a, a certain caliber weather be rifle, and, and he, it was... A brother wanted to buy it for him, but he wouldn't let him because it was just too much money and he couldn't see him spending that much money on it. But another brother said, hey, you've got this kind of rifle. Let me take it, send it to Weatherby. They can bore it out for, for that same caliber and it will take that same load. 
And Brother Branham agreed to it. So they took it and they boarded out, they machined it. And when he got the gun back, he took it to the range. And when he fired it, the gun exploded in his face. And he's talking about that here. He's saying, now if that gun would have started from the beginning and Weatherby dies and had been made a Weatherby rifle, it would have never blowed up. Because it would have been Weatherby rifle, their same kind of steel made up in their dies and everything and come right out into the regular rifle that it should be. But being it was something else and just not only converted but was perverted into something and that's what made it blow up. And that's the way we find ourselves along the road. We find so many times that people just can't stand the pressure of being a Christian. They can't stand the pressure of being a Christian is because they have never really died out to self and be reborn again. Made from the dyes of God to stand the load, the pressure that comes against a real Christian. You try to walk with a real saint of God and find that pressure hit against you like that. You blow up and be back where you was to begin with. But if you've been born again and really filled with God's spirit, then you're pressurized by God to stand the pressure that the world can put against it like that. But it must be that first. You've got, to be, you've got to die out. He said, you never really died out to self and be reborn again. In order to be reborn again, we have to die out to self. And then it's no longer me that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Amen. Dying out to selfishness and self and self-desire and self-love. Dying out to all that and be refashioned over again in the original fashion that can take the pressure of being a Christian. And won't blow up won't blow up when the heavy charge gets put in, won't blow up, amen, under the pressure. And because some can't take, uh, brother, some can't take the pressure of being a Christian. And because there comes times of great pressure when being a Christian. And we've seen in the, in the last decade, amen, where those who once believed the message and walked in it for years, because there was a discrepancy in birth records of the prophet, and they didn't know whether men fell in, off a bridge and died or not with no record, and they couldn't determine whether the cloud was made by a rocket or a supernatural, what happened? They blew up. It's shocking. How did you blow up? Everything looked right, amen? Been bored out right, amen? Because it wasn't an original, because it wasn't original from God, amen? It hadn't died out to go back to its original condition. It was only made over, amen? It was only taking something and making it look like a Weatherby and making it act like a Weatherby and make it take a Weatherby load. And we see other people that they serve God for a while and fall away, serve God and hit a trial and fall away, come and get baptized and, and sit with us for a while. And then when the pressure comes down and rejection from coworkers or rejection from family, they walk out. What's the problem? They haven't died out to self and reborn again in the original mold. Because the original mold can take the pressure that comes with being a Christian. Amen, Amen friends. And I say, I don't want to be a made over. I don't want to be bored out. I don't want to go through the shop to look like a message believer. I want to die out and go back to the original process, amen. Back from the original factory made out of the original die, from the original material and the original engineering diagram. From the ground up a believer, amen. From the soul up a believer. That's what we want, to take the pressure. Go to Galatians chapter 2. See, the blow up comes because there's still self preservation. Can't take the shame that comes from not having answers, can't take the rejection that comes can't stand in the face of criticism, can't stand there when, when everybody else in the support group has fallen away and changed their mind. When now there's more questions than we have answers and the questions are coming faster than the questions are getting answered. And what happens? There's a blow up. But when you've already died, and you have nothing to prove, 
When you don't have to provide for your self-protection, when you don't have to prove your sonship, when you don't have to defend God, amen, when you don't have to skip ahead, amen, in God's program, you can just stand there and say, I don't know. How can you do it? Look at this evidence. Look at these facts. Look at this person. Look at that person. Look at this ministry. Look at what happened in that church. Look at what happened over here. Look at all the disasters all around. You can look and say, I don't know. But the gun's not blowing up. And if you thought that was pressure, fasten your seatbelts. There's more to come. God, God puts the pressure, God allows the pressure to come. It's a testing to see if it's original material or not. Well, God, you know, God doesn't come and says, you're a bride, you're not. You're a bride, you're not. You're... No. God lets anybody come in that wants to come in. And anybody can be identified among us who wants to be identified. Anybody can take the message and say they believe it. But God will allow the pressure to come because the pressure will prove the original product. And I think we've served God long enough and watched long enough, you know, it's not always the loudest and the boldest. Sometimes they're the first to blow up. And it's not always the most zealous or most eager. Sometimes, eager, sometimes they're the first ones to blow up. Sometimes it's that little quiet one that is, is hardly observed. They just come all the time and believe all the time and say amen to all the word and love the message. And they just stay and stay and stay and stay. And all the ones popping off hot air go and go and go. Why? Because they were built right. They were able to die to themselves, go back to the original. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a real Weatherby rifle right there. There's a few things here that I wanna, I wanna share, just some things that's been mulling over in my heart. And I wanna read a few quotes. I'm gonna go back to Christ as the mystery of God revealed because I think it's so pertinent as we talk about this subject. But before that, I, I just wanna show, uh, Jesus set the example for us. And Jesus was the example of a son fully surrendered to the will of the Father. And he played that part perfect. He never, he never messed that up. He never injected himself or inserted himself. He, he was the son, uh, the son of God who was fully surrendered to the Father in all things. And his full surrender protected him from every trap of the devil. Because he would only do that which he saw the Father do. He never did of his own mind or of his own accord or of his own will. And his surrender was his protection. Do you believe me? And the bride is to follow the same pattern now. The bride is to be uh, uh, totally submissive to her headship, which is Christ, the revealed word. And in that submission to the word, she's not to take her own mind, her own reason, her own thinking, her own feelings, but she's to stay totally surrendered in, in humility and sincerity to the word. And her surrender is her protection, not her wisdom or her strength or her power. Jesus had power, he had gifts, he had all of that, but none of that was his protection in his hour of temptation. His protection was his surrender. Jesus in Gethsemane, amen, he was wrestling out the will of God and surrendering his will to the will of God, amen, and he went to Calvary having totally submitted and surrendered his will to the will of the Father, and all around Calvary, Brother Baron tells us, amen, were angels stationed on every tree and every limb. If he would just twitch his finger, they would come and rescue him. He had all power, he had all authority, amen, but he never used any of that to deliver himself. His deliverance and his protection was in his full submission. 
and his full surrender, amen. And it's a trap, amen. It's an absolute trap of the devil, amen, to be smart, to be cunning, to be wise, to be strong, to be powerful, to figure things out, to know things. It's a trap of the devil, friends. And I, I have warned and warned and warned, and I'll do it again, against conspiracy theories and internet this and, and YouTube specials and specialists and all of this stuff. I'm, I mean, forget it, friends. Well, I saw this. This was a government official said this and this. But this government official said this, this, and this. Which one do you take? Same credentials. Well, this was a, I mean, this is a professor at Harvard. Well, this is a professor at Yale. See, don't try to figure it out. That's a trap of the devil. Don't try to outsmart the devil in all his schemes and his plans. Just stick with the word. This is not the hour to get, get distracted by conspiracy theories and all kinds of internet, this and that. Forget it all and stay with the word. Get deeper into the message. Get more in love with Christ because our protection is not what we figured out. Our protection is not that we know what the, the, the new world order is doing. Our protection is in the fact that we are totally submissive to the word and the word will defend us, the word will protect us, the word is the wall we stand at, the word is a strong tower that we're righteous run into and are safe, amen. I don't need anything but the word, I mean, I don't need anything but Christ and my headship, my husband who will protect me, defend me, watch over me, defeat all the enemies around me and who is my husband? He's my mate, the revealed word of the hour. Don't get sucked into all this stuff, amen. Get sucked into the word, amen. Get sucked into Christ, amen, because that's our protection. Jesus' protection was his full surrender and submission to the Father. Our protection is our full surrender and submission to Christ, the revealed word. This is not the hour to get distracted. This is the hour to stay tuned in. And as you stay humbly submissive to the word, watch what God does all around. Delivers here and delivers there. Because God is good. His word is true. And he's not asking us to do anything but humbly submit to his word. That's what he wants on display. The father didn't want anything but a son who will submit to all his word. That's how the first son fell, by leaving the word. And, G, and, and every son that came after that fell somewhere along the way. Moses fa- failed. David failed. Noah failed. Along the way, all them sons failed. What he was looking for was a son that would not fail to honor the father in full surrender to his word. And he found it in Jesus Christ, amen, and and that was the capping off of the Old Testament. But now he's been looking for a bride, amen, who won't fail to totally be submissive and surrender to the word with no thought of her own, with no agenda of her own, with no will of her own, but to surrender to him. And it's failed in every age, amen, but he's predestinated a bride in this age that won't fail on the word, but she'll be surrendered to the will of the Father. She'll be surrendered to her headship. I want to read a couple quotes out of Christ as the mystery of God revealed and then share a, a couple more thoughts. Now God had a purpose and the hidden mystery and that's what I want to speak on to the church this morning, the hidden mystery of God. Now, this is right in the, uh, and Christ is the mystery of God revealed and Brother Branham's preaching this uh, message and he, he's telling us that that in this message he opens with the scripture Christ in you the hope of glory out of Colossians and he he said I want to take for my text or my context or however he says it the entire Bible so he's taking into context the entire Bible for this sermon and he's trying to show us that there's been a great mystery in God a hidden mystery of God that he had in his mind before the world ever began, and now that it's unfolded itself right down to this present hour that we're living, then you will understand clearly, then you, you see on, I believe, what, has been, what is being done. 
God's great mystery of how it's a secret. He kept it a secret. Nobody knew nothing about it. Even the angels didn't understand it. See, he didn't reveal it. That's the reason under our seventh mystery, when the seventh seal was opened, there was silence. Jesus, when he was on earth, they wanted to know when he would come. See, it's not even the son himself don't know when it's going to happen. See, God has this all to himself. It's a secret. So he's talking about the one great mystery of God, and he's talking about the secret, and he's talking about the seventh seal, and he's putting them all together. And this is what's been open to the bride in this day, the mystery of the seventh seal. A silence in heaven for a space of half an hour and seven thunders uttered their voices and John was even forbidden to write it. See the coming of the Lord. That's one thing he hasn't revealed yet of how he will come and when he will come. It's a good thing that he doesn't know. He has showed or revealed it in every type that's in the Bible. He doesn't tell it, he just shows it. <laughs> he doesn't tell it, he just shows it so you can see it. And when you see it, you'll know it, but he doesn't tell it. It's a mystery secret. Amen. It's a mystery to the world. It's a secret to the bride. He shows her. Amen. He showed or revealed in every type that's in the Bible. Therefore, the entire Bible is the revelation of God's mystery in Christ. Hum, the entire Bible is an expression of one goal that God had, one purpose he wanted to achieve in the entire Bible. If there's nothing else that you hear tonight, hear this. There's one goal that God had in the whole Bible, one purpose that God had in everything in the Bible, everything in the mystery, in the mind of God. He was all aiming to this one goal and this one purpose. Everything we believe in comes to one goal and one purpose. Everything God wanted comes to one goal and one purpose. We can get distracted with all kinds of other things and doctrinal wars and fights and all kinds of this and that. Should we do this? Are we allowed to do that? We're we not allowed to do that. Forget it all. Come to the mystery that God had. Amen. That he, he has not told, but he showed it all through the Bible. And here in this day when Brother Brandon's preaching, he says, I hope that you'll see it. And understand it, amen. I say forget about all the nonsense argument and all that. You've got an opportunity in the message of the hour at the opening of the seventh seal to know the mystery that was in God's mind from before the foundation of the world. The secret that he never told in full, but he slowly let it out over time. But now in the last time, he's going to show it down through the Bible because the seals are taken off. And if you don't get that... What does it matter if you get the form and the ritual correct? And you get the rules and the conduct and the order correct? If you miss the mystery? What does it even matter if you get the doctrine correct? If you miss the mystery? Brother Branham's bringing it all to Christ as the mystery of God revealed in this message. He's bringing the whole Bible and the whole purpose of God down to this. And 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 it's the seventh seal. One purpose he wanted to achieve in the entire Bible. And all the acts of the believers in the Bible has been in type in expressing what God's great goal is. And now, in this last day, he's revealed it and shows it. He didn't tell it, he just revealed it and showed it. Praise. Oh, that makes me want to jump up and click my heels because he revealed it and showed it to me, but he didn't tell it so everybody could have it. He just whispered the secret, the love secret to his bride. Amen. Oh, I'm going to read that again. And all the acts of the believers in the Bible has been in type. Everything you read... Well, you read through it and read through it and read through it and you say, okay, I'm not allowed to do this and I'm allowed to do that and we're not supposed to do that and that church has that wrong and that church has that wrong and that church. That's not what the Bible's written for. The Bible was written so that you could see the mystery. So that he could come to the end time and take the the seals off of the Bible and so you could look back down through it and see God's purpose, God's plan, God's goal that he had in the the back part of God's mind. Now I know it looks like I jumped ship and changed subjects, but I have not changed subjects. Because you will never accurately be able to discern yourself until you catch this mystery.
All the acts of the believers in the Bible has been in type and expressing what God's great goal is. And now in the last day, he has revealed it and shows it. And God's help, well, you'll see it right here this morning. <laughs> I hope you see it right here tonight, amen, this evening. What the Lord has had in his mind all along and has expressed it. Therefore, you can see the great meaning of what it's been to know this and then try to bring it to the people. See, and then you don't. I haven't went into details to try to explain it as God has revealed it to me. Skipping down, now we're in paragraph 139. But when Christ is identified in you, identifying his self, then you are Christ-like. Which the word Christian means to be Christ-like. There is your identification. All right. Now, and since he is our identification, then we should be identified with him by living for him. Notice. God has had a threefold purpose in his great mystery secret. So Brother Memory tells us there's one mystery secret, one goal, one achievement, one purpose that God has had, and he's going to preach on it this morning, and Christ is the mystery God revealed. Now he tells you that Christ in living himself in you makes you Christ-like, and he, now he's going to tell you that there's three folds to this one mystery secret, one purpose. Threefold purpose, and now when we want to go upon this morning is what is the threefold purpose? Now I believe by the help of God who is present, he'll show it to us. Now he had his threefold purpose. We want to find out what is the threefold purpose. Further down, he says he wanted to express himself. That was one of his great threefold purposes, was to express himself, himself identify himself with human beings to reveal himself in Christ. So the first part of his great mystery secret, the first thing he wanted to do was to express himself as in, to humans in a human form, and he did that through Jesus Christ. That was the first part of God's great goal, his great achievement, his great plan, his great desire, his great purpose that he had. The first thing he wanted to do was express himself to humans through a human. And he did that in Jesus Christ. Secondly, to have the preeminence in his body of believers that is his bride, that he might live in people. That's the second purpose. And the third is to restore the kingdom that fell in the Garden of Eden. That's your whole Bible. That's the whole purpose, the whole goal. That is God's great achievement to do that. Further in Christ is the mystery God revealed. He says, oh, if God can get him prisoners like that, now that's when he can express the preeminence as you see. What's his goal? First was preeminence on a man. He got that in Christ Jesus. Second was preeminence on a body of believers, a bride. He's doing that now. How? He wants prisoners. He wants people totally surrendered to him. No will of their own, no thought of their own, no selfishness, no other desire, only desiring him. He wants, what he wants is he wants the right kind of bride. He's never had the right kind of bride. God wanted the right kind of son, and he never had the right kind of son until Jesus Christ came along. And now that son has to have the right kind of bride, and that's what he's looking for in this day. And that's going to be his achievement, because he has already purposed that he will have upon the earth the right kind of bride. And that right kind of bride will be a reflection of the character of Christ because Christ was in total surrender to the will of the Father. Now the bride will be total surrender to her headship, Christ. What are you supposed to be doing on this earth? That. Period. That is, we judge everything on God's great goal and God's purpose in our life. We bring everything back, amen. When we lose focus of what God's purpose is in our life and what God's trying to achieve in this hour, we can get caught up in all kinds of nonsense and confusion. But we need to step back for a minute and say, what is the whole plan of God? What is God trying to do in this hour? What is the seventh seal? What does it have to do with me? And what am I supposed to do when I wake up tomorrow morning? 
And I say, for God, in order to God to fulfill his purpose that he had in the back part of his mind before the foundation of the world, what he wrote the whole Bible for and what he typed every character in the Bible did, for him to have that in your life tomorrow morning will be for you to wake up in the morning and say, God, this is your day, not mine. This is your life, not mine. I die fresh again. I lay myself on the altar. I don't want my way. I don't want my desire. I want only yours. Let your word and your word only rule in my life. And then we will be starting the day in the seventh seal. We'll be starting our day in the Bible. We'll be starting our day, amen, correctly, amen. He needs prisoners that he can express the preeminence. You see, he's got the man or the person so that he knows nothing but Christ. You get what I mean? All right, that's secondly. First, to express himself completely God in Christ. Second, to have the preeminence by this in his church, which is his body, the bride, till he could have the preeminence to express himself through them. See, when the devil, when Satan, through the serpent, came to Eve, the prophet of God tells us, and spoken word is the original seed, tells us that Adam was given a bride to reproduce himself. That was her purpose. That was her purpose. So the devil's goal to disrupt God's plan was just to get her off his purpose. Like, he wasn't trying just to get her to do something bad. He wasn't trying just to get her, you know, to slander God or say something bad so he can point to her and say, look, she's a rotten daughter. Actually, to derail God's program, to derail God's plan, which is the devil's, what he's attempting to do, he's not just trying to get you to do something bad or be naughty and tattle on you. And that's childish. That's not, we're not in junior high. He's trying to defeat God's purpose. He's trying to stop the threefold plan from coming to completion. He's trying to stop the seventh seal from coming to full fruition. He's trying to stop the mystery of Christ, the mystery of God from coming into full manifestation. He's trying to stop God's purpose, amen? And so what he comes to Eve to do with the temptation to Eve, he's not trying to get her to be bad, to be naughty. He's trying to get her off of God's purpose. And her purpose was to reproduce another son of God. And so he got her, amen, through the, the, the deception that he brought to her, got her to focus in the wrong place, amen, and, and she received the wrong seed, and she missed her purpose. And when she missed her purpose, the whole plan of God, amen, went into redemption cycle. Now the whole uh, perfection of Eden collapsed. The whole dominion of man fell. The, the title deed went back to God. Everything that was in perfection went into ruin and chaos began to break, break out and everything fell when she left her purpose, friends. Not when she was naughty, not when she was bad. I want to drive this home, amen? It wasn't a bad conduct, amen, that destroyed Eden. It wasn't just the adultery that destroyed Eden. The, 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 the adultery was missing her purpose and defeating God's purpose in that woman. And that's, it was a laser pinpoint strike to derail God's purpose in this creation. And God is not trying to get you to be naughty, to say bad words, amen, to look at bad movies. He's trying to get you off God's purpose. Everything he's doing, he's not, he's not trying to get you to, to, to look at a bad advertisement and say, ah, you looked at a bad advertisement, I'm going to go tell your father. He's trying to defeat God's purpose. He's trying to get you through selfishness and self-desire and self-will and entice you in your own selfish desires to slightly deviate from God's purpose in your life so that God no longer has preeminence. Instead of full control, God gets partial control. And if God gets partial control, he's looking for prisoners. He's not looking for prisoners at a halfway house that has a work program where they can leave and go to work and come back. He's looking for 100% prisoners, fully submitted to him so that he can fulfill the purpose. See, 
It's not about being good or being bad. It's about serving God's purpose. The devil is not trying to turn you into a bad person. He's trying to keep you from filling God's purpose because he's trying to defeat God's purpose. This is a great war between Lucifer and God. And God has a plan that he had formulated before the foundation of the world and his plan's ticking right on time. And the devil always thinks he's defeating God's plan but he's always using the same tactic. He always comes in to one of God's chosen and gets them to act in a selfish way. Got Noah to get drunk, David to lust after Bathsheba, Moses to get angry and lift it up in pride and smite the rock twice. He's always coming in and he's using self to defeat God's purpose. But God has predestinated a bride in this last time that will not be defeated. That means if she's not gonna be defeated, then there's going to be a bride that is going to die to self. Because I don't see any other way, amen, because the tactic all the way through the Bible has always been self, 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 because that's the nature that was in Lucifer and that nature's been injected into man through the fall and that's the nature that has to die so God can have preeminence so that he can fulfill his purpose so that he can defeat his enemy. See, when, oh, I just don't know how to say this to get it to come the way it's to me. There's two wrong ways that we tend to serve God as believers. Two incorrect ways. One is to believe that by a legal obedience to the word and recognition of the message and surrender to the message, that we will gain acceptance from the Father and be okay. Now, we don't verbalize that, but that's what we do, and that's how we think, and that's why when we make a mistake, we're so devastated because, you know, I messed up, and now I'm not in favor with God, and, and now I, I, I may not even be bride, and I blah, 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 blah. And it, it's an illegal attempt, a legal attempt to obey the message and obey the word to gain acceptance. And that's why sometimes people are on such pins and needles, you know. And that's why sometimes people, um, we tend to argue and fuss so much about little, you know, when Brother Bram says, how long is long, and cut hair, trim hair, and, and all of these things we start to really dial in on and focus in. And why? Because we've got the mentality that if I can just be obedient to the word and obey, that somehow I've gained some sort of acceptance. And these little issues become humongous issues. I'm not saying they're not important. They're important. But we can focus on those and miss the whole point. So through a legal effort, a, a legal believing that somehow in our ability to accept the message in its fullness and fully live it and fully obey it, that somehow that will bring us into salvation and acceptance or we can actually be message believers. But that is a self-serving religion that has self at the center point of all of our worship because we're trying to save self. Does that make sense? The other error is the error that the chief priests and Pharisees made that we are the chosen of God and God will always accept us. That I, Brother Bram said it this way, somebody said, God loves me so much I can do whatever I want and he'll forgive me. See, both of these are based on segments of truth. But they're not wholly the truth. Because Israel was the chosen nation. God had established the order of the priesthood. 
God had called, you know, he had put blessings on the priesthood. The chief priests were in place according to the law of Moses and the commandments of God. They had certain authority and certain rights and certain privileges under all of that. Amen. But they got to the place where they thought because of all of that, that they can now act contrary to the word of God and it would be okay. We're God's chosen. We're God's elect. God will forgive us. The, the truth is that God will always forgive and that you can never become non-elect, but it does not mean that God will not chasten you and punish you and spank you and allow destruction to come into your life. So we err on both sides. One side is I don't have to do anything to merit God's love and merit God's grace. God will always forgive me and, and I'm, all, I'm always okay with God because I'm bride. And the other one is, if I'm able to do everything and fully obey, I'm going to be okay. Or it proves somehow I'm okay. And I say, let's trash both of those ideas. Because the reality is, the whole thing is based off divine capstone love. God came down in this hour because he loved his bride to unite with her and to whisper to the one he loved secrets. Not to get her to jump through hoops and to perform. and That's not why. And not so she could go off and live any kind of life she wanted and neglect him. But so through a proper understanding and a proper revelation of who she is in the great mystery plan of God, that she will willingly lay down her life and surrender because she sees her position in God's plan. See, Jesus was not trying to gain favor with the Father. He already had favor with the Father. Do you believe that? Jesus was not trying to gain favor with his Father, and Jesus was not trying to get accepted, and he was not trying to get saved. But neither was he taking his position for granted and living any way that he wanted to live, knowing that I'm the son of God. He's the example. He's the first part of the threefold plan. That's the example part. He was the example son, showing that whatever spirit was in him that made him totally submissive to the Father, that same spirit was pulled out of him. And the feminine portion of that spirit's put in the bride. And now she's a reflection of his character and female form and body form. And she will now be that same level of submission to Christ through headship. Not to gain his favor, not to gain his acceptance, but neither will she tromp off, amen, and act like the world and do what she wants and observe all kinds of entertainment and worldly this and worldly that because I'm bride and I'll always be accepted and he'll always forgive me. That shows you don't have the revelation of the threefold mystery yet. It shows you don't understand God, you don't know his character, and you don't see your position. Because that's exactly the difference between Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. They thought their position was secure. Amen, but they didn't realize that God was a good father and he was going to turn from them to the Gentiles. They didn't think it was possible. They didn't think he would do that. And don't think God won't correct you and I. He'll, He'll chastise us. We're supposed to judge ourselves, but if we're, if we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord so that we won't be condemned with the world. See, for me, the point is the mystery. The whole point of it all is the seventh seal. And the whole seventh seal is the revelation of God's purpose. And I, when God reveals this great mystery to you, what he's doing is revealing your portion in the mystery. And he's revealing to you your position in the mystery. And that position doesn't make you arrogant, and that position doesn't make you rebellious, and that position doesn't make you fearful. See, the proper revelation coming the proper way Amen, of this threefold uh, uh, plan of the great mystery of God 
It, it doesn't put you either way in fear trying to gain acceptance with God or in rebellion and, and self-will worship thinking he'll always accept you no matter what you do. But the proper understanding of this great mystery of God and your, the revelation of your position in the mystery places you as the right kind of wife. And being placed as the right kind of wife, you're neither afraid to be rejected nor are you so arrogant that you'll chomp off and stomp all over your husband's commandments. But you will completely surrender to his will. Not to gain acceptance, but because he first loved you. Because he only whispers the secrets to his sweetheart. And when he whispers the secret to you, you recognize you're the sweetheart. And being the sweetheart, you fall in love with the bridegroom. And when you fall in love with the bridegroom, you become a prisoner bound in chains of love. And you don't want to do your will. You don't want to displease the Lord, not to gain his favor, but you have no desire. You know that you'll never be cast away. You'll never come into condemnation. You'll never have your name scratched off that book of life. You're never going to be rejected. You're never going to be any of that. But you so love him because he whispered the love secret to you because you have the proper understanding of the proper plan of God and your position in that plan. There's nothing you want to do but please him. It's love. And that's why when I, I, I bring this, and, when I, and I'm finishing up here, but I want to bring this because if we lose sight of this, we have no discernment. We don't know where we are, amen? We don't know what's motivating us or why we're doing what we're doing. If we lose sight of this, amen, we're going to go one way or we're going to go the other. We'll go into legalism or liberalism, amen, because we don't understand. But when we stay focused on the message of the hour, and friends, this is the message of the hour. All the doctrines, I mean serpent seed and Godhead and then and the church ages, all of that was the tying together of the loose ends to complete the church ages so that he could open the seals, amen, so that the seventh seal could come out and be shown and on display. This is the message. That's why when we start arguing and debating over the doctrines and over all these other stuff, sometimes I wonder, do we even have this great mystery secret whispered in our ears? Because, I, hey, once he revealed the secret to me, amen, and he showed me my position in the secret, I, I don't want to do anything wrong. I don't want to manipulate the quotes to give me a little extra freedom. Amen, that's just selfishness again. And I don't want to use the quotes to condemn my brother. That's just selfishness again. It's all self, amen. I've got a full-time job taking care of this vessel right here. I got no business judging another one. Amen. I've got a full-time job keeping this vessel lined up to that mystery secret, staying focused in the great love secret that he's whispered to me and pouring my heart out to him and dying to myself. Hey, it's more than a full-time job. I haven't even caught up yet. This is where our discernment will come from. When we lose sight of this, we're, we're, we're liable to, to, to swallow down anything or chase after anything or get off in the weeds anywhere, but we stay focused on what is the seventh seal, what is the mystery secret, what is my portion, where is my position, and understand that the devil is just trying to get you off your position. Because when we, when we start to think that the devil's just trying to get me to be naughty so he can tattle on me so I fall out of graces with God, then all, you try, all you're trying to do is judge and analyze everything off of the rule book to find out if I'm naughty or not. Does that understand? You understand what I'm saying? If it's all about the devil's just trying to get me to be bad, then I'm going to use the message, the scriptures, the message as a code of conduct to find out whether I'm bad or not. But I can follow all the conduct and still be wrong. I can still be off the purpose and follow all of the conduct in order. Because his purpose is preeminent in you. What's his purpose? His whole purpose. I, I, don't, I don't want to put anybody else on this. 
This is just me. And you take it however it's revealed to your heart. But God's entire purpose, his entire plan, the goal he had, everything he typed in the Bible, and all of it comes down to him having preeminence in me. Me. This vessel right here. This one right here. The whole plan for me, the one that's important, the thing that matters the most, is his entire plan of God comes down to him having total control of me and this vessel here being an absolute submission to Christ my head. And if I miss that, it doesn't matter what else I get right, I miss the message. I missed my Lord. I missed my husband. Amen. I haven't got the proper understanding. And if we lose that, then our discernment's muddled. We don't even understand what's going on in our heart because we think it's about being bad or being good or coming to church all the time or paying our tithes or keeping all the ordinances or or it doesn't matter because God loves me. All of that is not it, friends. It's all about him having absolute preeminence in your heart and you dying to self, amen, and giving him that preeminence. You may not even be able to find a quote, but you know what he wants. It might even be allowable in a quote. Do you understand what I'm saying? You might even be able to get a quote and say, that conduct, that action, that would be allowed. But your bridegroom is saying no. So are you going to take the quote, or are you going to follow your bridegroom? I'm not talking about going against the quotes. I'm talking about saying surrender to the word. Because you can find enough to make a case for this or make a case for that. But I don't want to make a case for nothing. I just want him to be supreme deity in my life. I want him to be my headship. I want him to be my Lord. I want this word to rule over me. I don't want to rule the word. It's where Eve got messed up. Eve was just supposed to stay surrendered. She had a purpose. And the devil got her to move off her purpose until she became the ruler. And she became the one to give out the truth. And that was wrong. God wants the bride to receive from her Christ. Not to be the one to determine this is the way we do it, that's the way we do it. But just to be a submissive bride that says, I just want his way. Not going to figure it out, not going to manipulate it, not going to twist it. But Lord, help me to die. Help me. If there's anything that we could pray every morning when we wake up is, God, help me to die. Help me, God, to stay surrendered. I don't want to miss your purpose in my life. I don't want through deception to get caught off of your purpose in my life today. I want to stay true to your purpose. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you could come. I want to read this quote to you while the musicians come. He said, even nature everywhere speaks of him. And nature is a great testimony in another way, that is, that we cannot have this resurrection life unless it serves God's purpose. You cannot have the resurrection life unless it serves God's purpose. Now, if a seed is planted and that seed is germatized, it brings forth a new flower. But if it isn't germatized, it will not bring forth a new flower. If it doesn't serve God's purpose, yet not just because it's a flower it rises, because it serves God's purpose. That's the reason the sun rises, is because it serves God's purpose. You realize what he's saying? The reason a flower is germinated, a seed gets germinated, and that seed falls into the ground and it comes up in the spring of the year, is because it serves God's purpose. If it didn't serve God's purpose, it wouldn't be germinated. It would just die in the ground. But the seeds that serve God's purpose come up. 
He said that's the reason the sun rises. The sun doesn't rise because it has to. It's held there by the word of God. The sun, and the sun moves and everything in the celestial body is in orbit because of the word of God. He holds it all by the power of his word and he can change it any moment he wants, amen. But that sun is rising because it serves his purpose. And we rise when we serve God's purpose. How many of you wanna raise from dead hybridization and denominationalism and dead thinking of man, then you have to serve his purpose. And if you don't serve his purpose, you can't rise. You can only rise if you serve his purpose. And his purpose is the mystery. His purpose is the threefold plan. That's his purpose. And the devil is trying to get us off our purpose. I'll read one scripture before we sing. Colossians 3 and 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. If you're dead and you're seated with Christ in heavenly places, set your affections on things that are above. He's not saying grandma's over there and mom, no. Heaven is consistent of the word. Set your affections on things that are above, on Christ, on the headship, on the fullness of the word. Set your affections on there, not on this world, because there's nothing here for us. We're just here to serve his purpose. I said, God, help me to serve your purpose, and only your purpose. If I could leave you with a thought, I'd like to leave you with this thought. When you go to judge yourself and examine yourself, examine yourself, your motives, your objectives, your wants, your desires, in light of this mystery, this plan, and this purpose, and your position in this purpose. And then you'll find that discernment gets a whole lot easier. Am I doing this just for me? Am I doing this selfishly? Am I doing this, or am I serving his purpose? When things get confusing and we need to have discernment, we need to back up and say, which part of me is willing to sacrifice for the baby? Which part of me is willing to cut up the word so that I can get part of it or have benefits? And which part of me is willing to say, keep it alive, keep it intact, don't harm it? When you find that part of you, amen, that is willing to sacrifice for the word, willing to give up for the word, I would identify with that part and say that's the part that I want to follow. Solomon demonstrated wisdom. I want to have discernment and wisdom in line with the mystery plan of God, which to me is no longer a mystery. To me, it's a secret. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a song. Will I just want to please the Lord? Be in His will in every way. To be lost in His presence, found in His likeness. To hear Him say, well done. I just want to please the Lord, be in His will in every way, to be lost in His presence, found in His likeness, hear Him say, well done. I just want to please the Lord, be in His will in every way, to be lost in His presence, found in His likeness, hear Him say,
Dear Lord Jesus, we love you. God, I believe, Lord, that you've showed us your great secret. The great secret that you've had, Lord, before the foundation of the world. I pray, God, that you revealed to each individual their position in that great mystery secret. And God, by that revelation, I pray you give us the proper understanding to realize who we are and where we are in your program and your plan, what our position is. Help us, Lord, to dis- just to, Lord, defeat every tactic of the devil that would try to get us off of our position. May we see it, Lord, and identify it, Lord, like you did when you were here in the wilderness. May we take your word and not the bait. Lord, may we surrender and submit, Lord, with no self and no selfish desire. May we just give over to you our whole lives. God, we want to be love slaves to you. We want to love you, Lord. We want you to have preeminence among us. Would you just take us now in a greater way? Open our eyes, Lord. Give us the eye salve. Rub it in our eyes that we can see this great position and this great plan. And that we can resist every tactic of the enemy that would try to get us off of our position. That we can stay true to you, Lord, through everything, through every trial, through highs and through lows, through excitement and through disappointment, through heartache and grief and times of jubilant praise. In all of it, Lord, may we give praise to you and be obedient to you and give love back to you. May we not be distracted, deterred, separated from you in any way. But may we do, Lord, may you through us accomplish what wasn't done in Eden. Eve left her purpose, but Lord, help us not to leave our purpose. Help us to stay true. That You can have the preeminence in us in all things. That you can display to this world through these bodies of flesh, these tabernacles that you can display through us what a submissive bride is, what a correct bride is. Just as you did, Lord, when you were here on earth as the Son of God, you you portrayed what a proper son was. Now through us, Lord, as your spirit lives through us and we surrender to your headship, Lord, may you display through us what a proper wife is, what a proper bride is, and that you might fulfill the second portion of your threefold plan and that we can move to the third phase, which is a restored Eden. Oh, how we long for that, Lord. How our hearts yearn for that. God, help us to stay at our post of duty. Help us to remain faithful to you, Lord, as a faithful, loving, submissive wife. We ask for these things, Lord, as we go from here. Keep us in your grace. Guide us with your love. Let us stay surrendered to your word in all things. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.